I'm Nick Harcourt, and we're here with Chester and Mike from Lincoln Park. And we're at the Wilton, which is a little bit of a different venue for us. Thank you for coming and playing in this great place. Oh, thanks for having us. Let, let's get into it. I mean, this, this is a band with a 15-year history. Um, six albums, five number ones, Grammys, biggest band on Facebook. What do you think it is about Lincoln Park's music and your career to date that keeps you so relevant and on top of things? You know, I, I think that we've always had a really great understanding of what it is we want to accomplish. And each of us as individuals in the band, we want to do what's best for the song. And we want to participate in the way that's going to make the song the best it can possibly be. And by doing that, I think um, we've learned over time to know how to control, you know, our egos in the, in, and also, you know, be able to control um, wanting to take over a song uh, individually, you know, with, our, with, with whoever's talents or, um, may want to shine. And I think that that's something that's helped keep us consistent. And, um, and also, I think it's kept a lot of our music a little um, more timeless and less kind of time specific or, you know, genre, uh, era specific. Can I ask each of you individually to explain the influence and power of music in, in your lives? Wow. Um, I can start. I mean, I was thinking the other day about like driving in a car. We used, we used to take these long trips with my, my parents and my brother. We'd drive up into the, um, we lived in LA and uh, we, we would go a couple times a year up to the mountains. It was like a, it was like a seven hour drive up to the cabin we usually went to. And, and it, the, I just have my, you know, I basically have my headphones on the entire time. And I have a hard time like remembering what it was that I was even like thinking about or, or, or I knew, kind, I kind of know what I was listening to, but it was, you know, I was always just completely immersed in the music and what I was, was listening to. And um, I grew up playing piano since I was like three. So it was always just kind of there. And my family, like my, my mom and dad weren't particularly musical. They just really, you know, thought it was something that they wanted me to, to have. And then at a certain point, they knew that I was really into it. Um, not so much the classical as just like, you know, being able to express myself. Jester? Um, yeah, it, I remember being um, fairly young and my, we were playing, my brother and my sisters were in the car. We were playing a game where we were deciding on, you know, telling everyone what we were gonna be when we grew up. And I said I wanted to be a rock star. Um, it was just really funny because everybody kind of looked at me like I was crazy or I, it, was, it was cute because they were all literally, they were being serious about what they wanted to be. And, um, and I was being serious too. I mean, I always remember m being drawn to music in a way that I just felt compelled to sing. I felt compelled to feel the music in a way that um, was important. And I remember all the way back to being a little kid and being like probably in fourth grade and hearing that Peter Estatera song from The Karate Kid. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, that's the moment I think I kind of remember kind of thinking I might love a girl for the first time or something or think I did and I just missed her a lot. And I remember always feeling that kind of connection for the song to that memory of feeling that way. It was just, and every time I hear that song, it's like, it takes me back to that place. And I think that's what music is. And a lot, for a lot of us, it's like, a, it really is the soundtrack to our lives. It kind of describes, it, it, the music that we listen to really is, uh, you know, kind of like a, um, it's kind of like the clothes we wear. It kind of shows people who we are and what we're about and w without, you know, having to really get to know somebody or um, it's just a great way to experience life, you know. Mike, maybe I could ask you to go back a little bit to the beginnings of the band, the genesis of the mm -hmm. band, so to speak, mid-90s, San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. What was going on? What was going on around you that made you guys get together to, to start this project at the beginning? Before I actually moved up there, I was, in, I was down deeper into the valley. I, I grew up in Woodland Hills. And the difference between Agora and Woodland Hills is that Woodland Hills at the time was, um, um, they had a school program where they were bringing kids up from the inner city to get them out of, basically to get them out of the hood 
and bring them up to an area that wasn't so dangerous and so they could focus on their, their school, their, their work, and improving as students and so on. And, and, and so with that said, a lot of my peers, a lot of my friends were from downtown LA, West LA, and um, they were the ones who introduced me to rap music. And, they, and our, our group of friends was like, it was like um, Korean, Mexican, Armenian, Jewish, you know, uh, it was, you know, 15 kids, all different backgrounds. A lot of different influences so, coming in. Yeah. And then I moved up to Agora, and it was a lot less so. They didn't have a program where, you know, there wasn't as much diversity. It's not so, that far away, though, is it really? No, but, it's only 15 minutes away. But, there but the kids who were getting bussed in were another 45 minutes away. So the people in Agora rarely went down an hour plus, you know, in LA traffic's like two hours. Um, but the bottom line is that once I moved up there, my tastes had already like really developed a lot in, with the you know, people that I grew up with. And so I'm in high school now and nobody's heard of Public Enemy, nobody's heard of LL Cool J, <laughs> nobody's heard of Two Live Crew, nobody's heard of Ice-T and NWA. And I'm kind of searching out people who knew the stuff I didn't knew. And one of my best friends um, actually one of the things we we got along so well, um, one of the reasons we got along so well is we both drew, we were both artists, um, and we both, he had a wicked sense of humor, he's so, so funny, and he really loved alternative music um, from uh, like Depeche Mode and, you know, the darker like new wave bands to uh, what was going on at the time, which was the beginning of grunge. And so he was introducing me to all that stuff, which I had never heard. And I was introducing him to all the rap stuff, which was coming out at the time. And that was around the time of like Cypress Hill and stuff like that. So like, I remember I gave him the first Cypress Hill album and introduced him that. He introduced me to like Alice in Chains and Nine Inch Nails. And we just got this crazy thing going. And so the two of us en ended up, he played guitar. I played, um, at the time I was learning how to use a sampler and keyboards. And I had this little four track cassette recorder that I could make songs on. And so the two of us would get together every weekend and just throw down like these weird ideas. Like sometimes they'd be serious songs, sometimes they'd be jokes, sometimes we were imitating other rap groups or bands or whatever. And we were just, we were just playing, you know? But it was just two of us learning how to kind of do everything that you would do to make a song. And that's, that was the beginning of the thing, you know? Um, as time went on, the it got more, more and more serious. We started adding the other guys in the band. You know, his next door neighbor was Brad, who was a guitar player. Um, Brad was going to school at UCLA with a guy named Dave. I was going to school with Joe, who was DJ. And so it all, we were just, we just picked like one degree of separation, like friends, brought them into the group. And then my good friend who I started the band with at a certain point, we just hit a wall and we realized that he couldn't be the singer. It just wasn't gonna work out. And that's when we started reaching out. We parted ways and we started reaching out and finding, looking to find that missing component, that other, that, that singer. And enter Chester. What were you doing at the time and how did you connect with these guys? <laughs> it was like the most random possible situation from my perspective. Because I was, I, it was about, I was almost 23 at the time when I got a call from Scott Harrington, who uh, represented uh, the band that I had been in, um, pretty much the only band I had been in, uh, through my teens and early 20s. And uh, we had hired him to kind of help, you know, see if he could help us get a deal or kind of get us get our, our uh, foot in the door at, at labels or whatever to get us, to get us seen, because nobody was coming to Arizona to see bands. And we were actually draw, you know, drawing quite a few people uh, often you know, sometimes thousands of people would come see us play, which is pretty cool. And uh, at that point, you're not, when you have two or, th two or 3,000 people showing up to see you play, that's not you as a teenager calling your friends saying, hey, come see me play. That's like- Something's going on. Yeah, people yeah. like kind of, you know, they're, they're figuring it out. Sure. Um, I think for us though, we, we didn't really have somebody in the band that was like, super gifted at um, communication and also uh, um, kind of with a vision. Um, but we, we, 
we could never find the right thing and we just kind of ended up falling apart. So I actually quit music. I was gonna like become like a desk person and sell something. I don't know. Sure, what I was sure you desk are. person. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I was gonna hang it's up like my a, skateboard it's like a and hobbit, get, a business hobby. I hung up my skateboard and cut my dreadlocks off and put my pleather suits away and uh, put my tie on and, and uh, loafers and showed up and scanned maps and well, that well, kind of stuff. Clearly, that wasn't gonna last. So, so I got this phone call randomly out of nowhere from Scott after years of not really talking to him, and then um, he told me about these these kids from California who had were creating something really special that, that, that sounded different and that really had potential in his opinion. And they needed a singer and he, the first person he thought of was me. And uh, I kind of laughed and I said, you know, screw it. I'll take a, I'll take a listen to it. I listened to it, it was great. And I asked my boss if I could uh, try this thing out for a while and if it didn't work, if I could have my job back. And she said yes and so I left. I literally, within a few days, I was, in California, and I pretty much think, with the exception of like a week after that first week of us getting together, I stayed out there, um, and I have been out there ever since. All of this experimentation, both sonically and you finding your voice, led to the appropriately titled Hybrid Theory. And you guys came out of the gate with that album. Tell us about that time, late 2000, early 2001. Well, I think for us, it was a really crazy time. It was like, I think, probably the single most, um, I think, confident moment in our career. Like we knew, like we had a thing and we were like, we knew that it was cool and we knew that we liked it. And we were excited about it. So we just like, all we wanted to do was more of it. And um, it was really hard for, I think, a lot of labels to understand how to even market this market us because in one second you're hearing a song like points of authority which is pretty heavy and then like the next thing you hear is like a song that would eventually sound like or become something like in the end it's really kind of poppy and almost like not if you heard them separately you probably wouldn't even think they were the same band so i think a lot of even if they liked a piece or a thing or something, it was hard for them to put the whole thing together and really see what it was gonna be and how it was gonna work for them. Well, they also, at the time, they were thinking through the lens of what was already popular. And to them, they couldn't understand the difference between new metal at the time and what we were doing. Like, we never considered ourselves a new metal band. And that was the thing that, that eventually got, you know, we got labeled as. Um, and the main thing was just that there was rapping and there was like that, the, the certain you know, guitar sounds and whatever, but we never wanted to carry that flag. We always thought of ourselves as doing something different. And a part of it was because the references were, like most of those bands, like I, had, I was calling them frat rock at the time. Like that was my word for it before there was a really word new Imagine metal. Because it was very like, like uh, it, was, it was macho to the point of being like misogynistic. Imagine being in a band and, the, and making a record and the people that are controlling the purse strings and kind of, you know, wanting, to, wanting you to sit, now, now, now you're in business with somebody, they want to sell your stuff. And they're, they, they, you know, um, uh, obviously, reasonably so, are in the business of selling music, so they have an opinion that they feel is valid. And they're telling you to be like something that you're kind of like making fun of. On the yeah. side. And clearly, we don't. You know, we know the difference, and, and they uh, don't get the difference. It was sure. a very, it was a very turbulent kind of time for us because we knew what we wanted to do, but we kind of got signed. And the and, and at the time, the label really didn't want us. It's just one of these things where it was like, we had to really fight, and I think that that kind of in that kind of anger and frustration and all that stuff really fed into, I think, the, 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 that was our story. You know, that's what was pissing us, pissing us off. And, and so, and so we had to fight for it. And then when it came out, it was like, to everyone's surprise, and our, continuing our, the to, the number I, one, continuing the week to it came me. out, <laughs> the week it came out, we were saying, uh, we had like guesses on how many albums it would sell the first week. You know, it was, we were in our, we were traveling across, 
the U.S. in an RV together playing shows. And the low, the low guess was 5,000 copies the first week. And the high guess was 12. And it came out and sold almost 45. And more success, continued success. But with success often comes a time uh, for a lot of bands, a lot of artists, where success perhaps gets scary, where success is perhaps something that people are frightened won't continue. And I know that, Chester, you, you hit a point where you needed to really take stock of where you were at. What, what was going on for you? Well, I think for me, um, the success of the band was never really the thing that was the problem for me. I mean, a lot of my stuff I was carrying around for a long time. And then it was also like the, per the relationship, uh, you know, honestly, between my ex-wife and I at the time really played a, a huge role in kind of how I viewed the world and kind of how I, I secluded myself in a lot of ways from people because you just, you, when, you, when, you're, when your home life is so weird, um, you kind of don't want people to see a lot of it. So you kind of, you know, you just let people see a little bit of it. But when you do that, you, you kind of find yourself really not knowing who you are. And I knew that it, it got to a point where the person that I, was, that, I, that I knew who I was in my mind and in my soul, I wasn't being that person outwardly in the world. And so that kind of fucks with you a little bit. Uh, so um, I think for me, you know, uh, it was more of a personal um, spiritual journey as opposed to like, a, how am I gonna, how am I reacting to the success of what I love to do? And that's when everything else caught up at the same time. So the stuff that I was carrying from my childhood with that, coupled with probably the fact that I was successful and I could kind of disappear for a while, you know, um, I think that was a perfect combination for a lot of things uh, where uh, I needed to, you know, reevaluate how I wanted to live my life. And so the band came and helped me out and we, you know, I got um, rid of a lot of things and replaced a lot of things with some... With, I think that was a really some, important time. With some, good, with some good people around me and good positive uh, experiences that weren't just the band. A lot of people find as they get older that they have trauma yep. fr fr from their past mm -hmm. and that things that are happening today can trigger that trauma. You talk about your divorce. Yeah. Um, once that was triggered for you, I mean, a lot of bands go through addiction and problems like that. Yeah. And once you realize that that's what you were in and your friends are coming to you saying, hey, you're our friend, you're not just the singer in the band, how can we, how can we participate and help you? Yeah. I'm guessing that music had a lot to do with that. Well, I think for me, music was always the one thing that I enjoyed the most of it, about life. And it was the one thing that was consistently, um, especially in this group, consistently paying off. So you put the time into communication, you put time into the work, and then you get the fruit of that, and everyone was kind of moving in sync. So when you have something that's moving in sync, and then you just remove yourself from that and then go into the rest of your day, and it's not in sync, it becomes really frustrating. And so uh, in many ways, gears were clicking on really high levels, but uh, for me, things just weren't really moving in every other aspect of my life, moving in the same direction. And so um, it was that transition, pe transitional period when we were making Minutes to Midnight. Not only were we transitioning as artists and going, we're, you know, we're working with Rick Rubin, but we're, all, you know, we're ready to go make a record that doesn't sound anything like what people are gonna expect and it's gonna be risky. But it was also like, okay, I'm going to like now go um, work on enjoying the rest of life mm -hmm. outside of making music. So, <laughs> I, the, you know, it was good that the band took a really long time to like kind of experiment and play for me personally because it gave me a chance to like come in and be productive and be able to go away and be productive and then come in and be productive and then go away. And all of a sudden it was like, started coming around and it was like, oh crap, like we never, I don't think the guys ever even really knew who I was as a person up to that point because I was just like a mess. Um, uh, I was just kind of surviving. And so um, it was really a fun time 
um, for the band, even though it was a very difficult time. I think it was a really um, inspiring time, and it was a really, uh, it was where we, we went from being, for me it was like, I wanna be friends with you guys, but I don't really know you guys. And it was like nine months, you know, a year later, we're, we're, we're assigned, and two years later, we've got like the biggest debut, one of the biggest debuts of all time. How would you describe the place the band was in going into the recordings for the new album, Hunting Party? Well, I think that we had comfortably gone um, way out of where uh, anyone who even was close to the band would think we would go. I think it, it's, been, it's been kind of fun to um, go somewhere creatively and then people think they have you pegged and then you go somewhere else and then they freak out about it and then they kind of get used to it and then they appreciate it and then they think they have you pegged and then you freaking go even crazier. But, but you've always, like you've always done kind of, that. You've always wanted it's this to thing where it's, surprise. Yeah, it, it's, it's scary because when we do it, we know we're doing it and we know what that means to the people who have expectations. And it's scary sometimes uh, to put a record out going, we like it, which is the yeah. most important part. That's the most important thing for us. We all have to check off on everything, which also is a very interesting process and it's something that we've gotten better at over time. <laughs> but I think it's really, a, the reason why we laugh about it is because we haven't gotten rid of the process because it, do, it is the best way to include everyone in the band all the time throughout the whole process to make sure that when we put a record out, someone's not going, what? That song made it? Or I didn't, you know, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we, we've learned how to take risks, be confident about it, because we know that if we all like it, then we can stand behind it even if everybody else says they don't, <laughs> which would be shocking. So 15 years in, six albums, Clearly, you've pushed yourselves creatively, but you've evolved as, as artists and as, and as guys. Maybe I can ask you, each of you separately, maybe starting off with Mike, give us one of your greatest musical moments, whether it's on stage, whether it's in a studio, whether it was in a songwriting process, something that stands out to you. Um. On a personal, on, a, on just a personal level, um, it's funny because I can, it's, I feel like sitting here today, like I always, um, Chester's so nice and so like it's so always so flattering to do these types of interviews with him because he'll always say the nicest things about me, <laughs> and he and he means them and he, it, he I, seems and easy I don't to get even and with. I don't even have to pay him to do it. <laughs> um, it's really, it, but sometimes, you know, as, as a group, like we all get like, um, you know, we, we, we're in the tunnel and it's, it's a fast and crazy ride to be in this band. And it's always a lot going on. And um, like, if you follow us on social media, you'd know immediately how insane it probably is on the inside because we're, it's like a new, it feels like a new thing is happening or getting released or whatever every few days. <laughs> um, there was a time when, when like all the way all along, I just did what I did. I, when we were in the studio, I just knew my role, and I was just did what I did. And there was a time, there was a conversation I remember having with the guys in the you know around the time of a thousand suns, when they said you know we want to give you a producer credit on the album because that's really what you're doing. And we didn't really know, none of us knew that that's what my role was. We just thought it was writing, but it wasn't. It's, there's something else. And it was like this nod of, of a, like not only um, like an acknowledgement of like work done, but also a, a, like, a, like a trust that they were putting in me to say like, you're gonna help steer the ship. And, and we're putting it on paper so that everybody knows that's what you're doing. And I think as time went on, I took that role more and more seriously to the point where on this new, on, on the hunting party, it's a self-produced record. It's just me and Brad. Brad's always been my like right-hand man in the studio. He's really great at a, at a number of really important things in the studio. And he, I always, he's always my sounding board. Um, and 
together, like we feel like at this point, we've learned enough stuff that we can actually say in our heads, say no to the idea of working with Rick Rubin and feel okay with that. Feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm not insane. better. I'm not better than Rick, but I know what I want, and I know I can get there without any help. And I may not be as good as him, but I know that I can get exactly what I want. I think when it came to this album, I think this is the, probably the most proud moment for me was making this last record because we literally got to the point where everyone around us now sees us the way that we see ourselves as a group of guys that when we get together, something special happens and we're good enough now so that our peers and the people that, who do business with us to let us just kind of do it because we didn't ask for Mike and Brad to produce the record. It just happened that way because we're making music, playing it for the guys at the Warner Brothers. They're excited, saying, great, keep it going. It was like, there was never a moment where it felt like, I'm sure if there had been, you know, the guys at Warner Brothers would have said, hey, you know, these are great, but it might be a good idea to talk to somebody and get somebody in here to kind of push things around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely a conversation that it would have happened every other album. Now we're at a point where it's like, this is really great and it is working, why? Because there isn't that feeling that we need to work with somebody else and it just kind of happened this way. That is where you want to be as an artist is to be allowed to be in your most comfortable zone. And for us, it's working as a band together. It's so great talking to you because the passion that you both exude from talking about the early days to talking about this most recent album, the, the fact that both of you talk about that as being a highlight for you musically is, is pretty impressive. I want to thank you for talking to us. Great pleasure to have you on Guitar Center Sessions and thank continue, you. continued success for Linkin Park. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. That does it for another episode of Guitar Center Sessions. My thanks to Chester and Mike from Linkin Park and the whole band. Until the next time, I'm Nick Harcourt. Thanks for watching.